Stanley. be seated. I'd like to welcome you all to Monish Lane Free Presbyterian Church this afternoon. We are gathered here today for this service of remembrance and thanksgiving for the life of Mrs. Ellie Hamilton. And on behalf of the family circle, let me thank you all for your presence here today. I know that your presence is greatly appreciated for the funeral. And the family have asked me to convey their thanks to all those over the years who so attentively cared for Ellie, especially all those at Lawnfield House in Newcastle and Anne's Care Home in St. Patrick, and also especially for the friendship of both Angela Cummings and the Reverend Ross I know that friendship was greatly appreciated by Ellie. But on behalf of the session committee and church family here in Monish Lane, I would like to express our sincere Christian sympathies to the family circle and especially to Ellie's children, Ivor and Elvis, to Ellie's daughters-in-law, Helen and Valerie, and also to Ellie's grandchildren, Clifford, Pauline, Andrew, Philip, Nicola, and Gareth, and also to Ellie's great-grandchildren as well. Our thoughts and prayers are with you all at this sad time of loss. And to the whole of the further extended family circle also, let me assure you too of our continued prayers for the days that lie ahead. Remembering the words of Scripture at this time, Psalm 46 in the verse 1 tells us that God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. And also the words of 1 Peter 5 and the verse 7, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. We'll commence our service today by turning to our first hymn in the order of service, please. And it's a very well-known children's hymn, but it's a wonderful truth. Jesus loves me, this I know. You know, there was an old preacher that was asked to summarize the whole of his theology in a few lines. And he replied, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. It's simple words, but profound words as well. We'll stand after the organist has given the introduction, and let's sing with all of our hearts. Let's stand together. Yeah. 
seated. Now let's still our hearts before the Lord in a word of prayer. Let's have every head bowed, every eye closed as we come before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before Thee acknowledging that there is sorrow of heart in this church today. Thou knowest there is a grieving family, there are grieving friends, and grieving because of the loss of a, a mother and a grandmother and a great-grandmother and a friend. But, O oh, Father, we thank Thee that Ellie Hamilton was saved. We rejoice that right now she is in heaven's glory. We thank Thee that 30 years ago she too had repented of her sin and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ to save her. And even though there may be sorrow of heart in the gathering today, those of us that are saved, we don't sorrow without any hope, but we know that there will be a grand reunion in the glory, and it is only goodbye and farewell for a time, because then we will rejoice with the Lord forevermore. But, O oh, Father, Thou knowest, in this gathering tonight, uh, or today, there will be those that uh, don't yet have the same hope within their souls that Ellie Hamilton had. They're not saved yet. Thou knowest those among the family and uh, the circle of friends that are not yet right with Thee. O oh God, we pray that they would trust the Lord Jesus Christ as Saviour. We pray that they would repent and believe the Gospel and that they would accept that simple yet profound truth that we have been singing, Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. And we pray that they too even as that last line said, would have that hope of glory. He will take me home on high one day. So, oh God, we pray that thou would even comfort those that are brokenhearted at this time. We pray that thou would use even this funeral service as the catalyst of bringing some man or woman or young person to Christ. And we pray that thou would especially wrap thy loving arms about those that sorrow. Lord, we think especially of Ivor and Elvis. We pray that thou would have thy hand upon them. We remember Helen and Valerie as well. And Lord, thou knowest all of the grandchildren, Clifford, Pauline, Andrew, Philip, Nicola, and Gareth. We pray that they may know the love which only thou canst give. And we pray for all of the many great-grandchildren as well. And we pray that each one may know that same hope that Ellie had and that they would come to saving faith in thee. But help us now. We pray that all will be said and done to thine honor and to thy glory alone. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now we're turning in the word of God to Psalm 103, and we're going to read three readings, short readings together. And this first portion in Psalm 103 reminds us that even the longest life is relatively brief when it comes in comparison to eternity. And we read in Psalm 103 in the verses 8 through to 17, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. As for man, his days are as grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourisheth. For the wind passeth over it, and it is gone, and the place thereof shall know it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him, and his righteousness unto children's children. And then John chapter 14, and the verses 1 to 6, and we find that in spite of the fact that our lives are short and God's mercy is everlasting, we read in John 14 the way that we can be made right with God and then the hope of heaven for those that are saved. 
And it says in the first six verses of John 14, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? You see, the verse 6 is very important, so I want to highlight it to you. How can we know the way to heaven? Verse 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And then one more reading, Revelation 21, and the verses 1 to 6 again. And we read here of something of what it is like to be with the Lord. There's no sorrow, no tears, no pain. And Revelation 21 and the verse 1 states, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. He said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. We trust the Lord will bless those public readings of his holy and precious word to each of our hearts. I want to draw your attention to one little verse that I highlighted earlier in the reading. It's from John chapter 14 and the verse 6. And the word of God states, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now, Ellie Hamilton was a kind-hearted, quiet, unassuming, and gentle lady. She was a devoted wife, a doting mother and grandmother and great-grandmother, and she had a wonderfully bright smile. I'm sure everybody here that ever spoke with Mrs. Hamilton knew that it didn't take long talking to Ellie before you were smiling, laughing, and as we would say in this country, enjoying the crack. She was one of those characters. Mrs. Hamilton had a wonderful sense of humor, you know. I remember not that long ago, only a couple of months ago, really, when I was visiting with her in St. Patrick, we were sitting in the lounge and she was eating a wee bun and taking a cup of tea, as she always liked to do. And one of the members of staff mentioned to her that I got engaged lately. And she said, oh, no, I was hoping you would ask me. And that was the type of... Uh, wit that she possessed. She was that type of a lady. She was quick-witted and she loved to smile. And I know each one here has their own particular memories of Ellie. And we could spend a long time recounting all of those happy instances together. But something that stood out to me, and I'm sure stood out to many of you here as well, is that Ellie Hamilton loved the Lord. She loved the Lord Jesus Christ, and she loved to sing the praises of the Lord with all of her heart as well. Just on her last birthday, her 101st birthday, we went down, we took the guitar, we tortured her a little bit by trying to sing, but she loved to sing out the old praises of Zion. She just loved to sing praising the Savior that she adored. And maybe you ask, well, why is that the case? Why did she love to sing those old hymns? Why did she love to quote the word of God? Why did she love all of those things? Because she was a saved woman. Because she was a born again believer. As you've noticed on your order of service, you'll see a date she was born and also a date that she was born again. Because 30 years ago in 1993, 
at a mission held in Leganani with our brother Desi McComb, who's here, and also our brother Ivor Park, who's also here as the evangelist. She was concerned about her soul, and soon she put her trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for saving faith. She got right with God. She asked the Lord to forgive her of her sin, and that's exactly what the Lord did for her. And with that assurance now that she was saved and she repented, she believed the gospel, I have no doubt about it today that Ellie Hamilton is in heaven's glory. And that's a wonderful hope, even though we are a people here that sorrow at her passing. But before I go on, I want to ask very simply, will you meet her there? Will you meet her in heaven? Oh, Ellie Hamilton is in the glory today, but among family and friends and all those that knew and loved her, will you meet her there? Will you trust in Ellie's Savior? Will you come to the Lord Jesus Christ? You know, Ellie meant an awful lot to this congregation. She was loyal to this church in Money Lane, meeting by meeting. She would have been found in her place. She loved to hear the word preached. And you could see that in her life as well. It flowed out of her. She had a love for Christ and endeavored to live for the Savior day after day. And I know it was her desire that when this funeral service were to come, that it was her prayer that knowing that there would be unsaved people gathering in, that ultimately the gospel would be preached and souls would be saved among those that she knew and loved the dearest. So I want to ask a very important question today, a very simple question, Nothing profound about it at all, but very important question, arguably the most important question you could ever answer in your soul, and it's this. Are you ready for heaven? Are you ready for heaven? Because John 14 and the verse 6 tells us the way to heaven. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. As I've already told you, Mrs. Hamilton had prepared, prepared three decades ago, asked the Lord to forgive her, believed on Christ. She was prepared. And death was not something to be feared. Death was something we could almost say to be embraced, knowing that it was that passage and that doorway through to her blessed Savior. But there's only one way to heaven when you die, and that is by asking God to forgive you by trusting in Christ alone, just like Mrs. Hamilton did. So I ask you again, are you ready for heaven? Are you ready? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There's three things I want to leave with you, and I promise I'll not be long, but three things that I leave with you. Number one in our verse, the sinner, the sinner. You say, but it doesn't mention the word sin in our verse doesn't mention the word sinner in our verse, but implies it, doesn't it? If the Lord Jesus is saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me, the clear implication is that in our sin, we don't know the way, we don't possess the truth, and we don't have life. That's what it's saying. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And that's exactly right. We, in our sin, did not know the right way, we didn't know the truth and we didn't have life promised to us in heaven and home. Very simply because of our sin. It's only a three-letter word, only a small word, and yet, yet has massive repercussions for our souls. That word sin and Romans 3 in the verse 10 tells us a little of our sin and our condition. We are born in sin, sheep and in iniquity. It says in Romans 3 in the verse 10, there is none righteous, no, not one. Now, some of us, at times, we can be guilty of being self-righteous, thinking we're okay, thinking I'm, I'm a good person, I'll get my own way to heaven. No, there is none righteous, no, not one. The verse 11 says, There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. In fact, we are so sinful, I am so sinful, I include myself with everybody else, we are so sinful that in our sin we actually don't desire to get right with God at all. That may be the reason why I'm sure some at a funeral service like this are saying, I wish the preacher would hurry up and finish. Why? Because there is none that understandeth, none that seeketh after God naturally. Then the verse 12 tells us, they are all gone out of the way. 
They had together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. But the thing I want to leave you with is this. They're all gone out of the way. That's where our sin has led us. Our sin has led us astray. Our sin has separated us from a holy and righteous God. And I'm sure many of you can remember from your Sunday school days learning about the straight and narrow path and the broad road. Well, in our sin, we're on the broad road leading to hell, leading to destruction, leading to wrath, leading to torment. That's where our sin takes us, on the broad road. You know, not that long ago I was in a hardware shop in Balna Hinch with another ministerial colleague, friend of mine. And there was a brethren man serving us. And he said, you know, men, there's one good thing about the broad road. And I sort of lifted my ministerial eyebrow, wondering what this man was about to say. And he said, there's one good thing about the broad road, and that's this. There's room enough to turn. There's room enough to repent, to turn, and to get on the right road to get on the straight and narrow path. But this is the point. Our sin has taken us away from God. And Romans 3 verse 23 tells us, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now you may not believe me, but believe the word of God. In Exodus 20, you read of the Ten Commandments and you read there of God's law. That is what we have broken that is where we have sinned. That is where our rebellion and our spiritual criminality lies in breaking God's law. And you say, what kind of laws are there? Well, it says, thou shalt not covet. You ever looked at somebody else's car or somebody else's house and said, I wish that was mine? Of course we have. If we're honest, all of us have. We've broken God's law. The Bible says, thou shalt not bear false witness. Ever told a lie? Maybe you say, preacher, it was a white lie. Doesn't matter whether it was white, pink, red, or green. A lie is a lie. And ultimately, it's breaking God's law. And you could go through it and time and time again. We've broken God's law. We are sinners. And Romans 6 and the verse 23 gives us some terribly frightful news. And it is fearful news. For it says, for the wages of sin, or the payment for sin, or the reward for sin, is this. For the wages of sin is death. Death in hell forevermore. That's what the word of God tells us. That's our plight. That's our peril. And you know, friend, I'm going to be straight with you. I deserve hell, and so do you. All of us do. That's our sin. That's where our sin merits. But the point is, our verse tells us, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In our sin, we're on the wrong road. We don't have the truth, and we certainly don't have life. We're facing death and hell. But then I want you to note not only the sinner, but secondly, the sacrifice. The sacrifice. Because here in our verse, it says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. But even though in our sin we're on the wrong road and we don't know the way, Jesus Christ prepared the way. He made an escape route. He, he gave us a place where we could be rescued, where we could be redeemed. He gave us the right way. And what did he do? He went to Calvary. He shed his precious blood. Oh, think about it for a moment, my friend. What did the Lord Jesus do? Jesus Christ, as the only begotten Son, He left heaven's glory and He came to this wicked world of ours and He did something that you and I could never do. You and I are sinners. You and I broke God's law, but He, he perfectly obeyed all of God's law. And then, then He was betrayed. Then he was arrested as if he were a common criminal when he was sinlessly perfect. Then we read how he was beaten and he was mocked and he was spat upon. We read that they stripped him and they arrayed him in purple and they, they drove a crown of thorns into his brow. We read of how then they, they bowed to him and they said, Hail, hail, King of the Jews. I tell you this, they didn't mean a word of it. And then... They stripped him again and they scourged him and they scourged him and they scourged him until his back was opened up like a plowed field. You know, at times I used to wonder, why is it that the Lord actually 
sort of collapsed when dragging the cross up to Golgotha's hill? I'll tell you why. Because the majority of people didn't even survive the scourging. The majority of people died from loss of blood at that point. But they put a cross upon his back. They made him drag it till he could carry it no longer. Then he got to Calvary's cross. And do you know what they did, my friend? They nailed him. You say, I've heard this before, friend, but do you understand it? They, they nailed him through his hands and through his feet, and they hung him up in the air. You can imagine the gravity trying to pull him down as the nails kept him up. And you say, why? Why would he do that? Why did he freely die? You know, the Lord himself said, at any moment, he could have called upon 12 legions of angels to come and take him from that cross and deal with all of his tormentors, but he didn't. Why did he die? He died to make a way for us. He died to save me from my sin. He died to save Ellie Hamilton from her sin. He died so that there was a way of escape for us. And you know, in Hebrews 2, in the verse 3, we read a solemn question. And if you go in the hall next door for tea later on, you'll see it in bold letters across the main wall. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? I want to tell you, if you neglect Jesus Christ, if you neglect the truth of Calvary, if you neglect the life that he provides, if you neglect the way of salvation that he has offered, if you neglect it and say, no, it's not for me, I have no time for God, I have no time for Christ, I have no time for what that preacher is saying, if that is going to be you, I warn you, friend, there is no escape. There is no escape if you neglect this so great salvation. And the point is this, Christ has made a way. And Christ also told us the truth. You know, in Mark 1, in the verse 15, in his very first sermon, he told us how you can get on the right road. He told us how you can get to heaven. He told us how you can know that you're no longer on the broad road leading to hell in your sin, but on the straight and narrow path to glory. He told us how. He said, repent ye and believe the gospel. Turn from your sin. That's what it means. And about turn. Turn from your sin. Repent. Ask God to forgive you and trust Jesus Christ alone for salvation. That's all. It's not about going to church, even though going to church is good. It's not about being a good person or a clean living individual or any of those things. That's not what it's about. It's about coming to God, God's way through Jesus Christ. And you know the blood that he shed upon that cross? That blood can wash away all of your sin. You know, in 1 John and the one, uh, 1 and the verse 7, it says, The blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, God's Son, cleanseth us from all sin. Not just some sin. You know, if it cleansed us just from some sin, I would still be going to hell. If it cleansed us even from the majority of sin, still we would end up in hell. But it cleanseth from all sin. And you've got to trust Him for that. But then not only does He show us the way and the truth, but He gives life. And that's what we've been reading about in John 14. That's why we read it, because for Ellie Hamilton, she's now enjoying being in the presence of the Savior because she became a Christian. And it says, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And in Jesus Christ, He is the way, He is the truth, and He is the life. But He's exclusive. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So we find in this verse the sinner and the sacrifice. Last of all, thirdly, the Savior. The Savior. Because it says at the end of our verse, not only Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But listen to this. I want to warn you now. It says no man or no woman or no child for that matter. It includes us all. It's referring to mankind. None among mankind. No man cometh unto the Father, but by me. You see, the gospel, heaven, it's exclusive to Jesus Christ. He is not just a way. Some would tell you he's a way. He's not just a way. He's the way. That's a very important distinction, very important difference. He is the only way. And I tell you again, being a good person, it will not save you. Giving to charity, it will not save you. Going to church, all those things, it will not save you. Even reading your Bible, it will not save you. 
You need to come to Jesus Christ alone for salvation. Maybe there's one here and you're asking, well, how? How? How do I do it? You know, you're not the first to ask that question. You know, there was a man in, in the book of Acts called the Philippian jailer. We're not given his name. We're just told his job title. He was the Philippian jailer, but he cried out, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? How can I be saved? Maybe you're saying that. Do you want to know the answer that was given? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. That's how you get right with God. That's how you trust Christ. Friend, there is no other way. If you're relying on something else to get you to heaven, it will only fail, because no man cometh unto the Father but by the Lord Jesus Christ. So, friend, I... I plead with you, don't walk out those church doors today without the Savior. Come to him today. He is willing to save you. He stands with arms wide open, ready to take you, ready to save you, ready to embrace you. But friend, please, I plead with you, don't be rejecting Christ. Because everybody here will make a decision. You will. All will make a decision today. Maybe you will decide, I'll be saved today. That's the best decision you could ever make, by the way. But if you go out those church doors today and you say, no, I'll get saved some other day, you're actually rejecting Jesus Christ for now. You're saying no to the Savior. And I plead with you, don't walk out trampling upon the free gift of salvation that is offered to your soul. Isaiah 55 and the verse 6 says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found, call ye upon him while he is near. Because I'll tell you this, you may never receive another opportunity like this. You may never receive another opportunity like this again. Yesterday, we are gathered around the funeral service of one that reached the grand old age of 101. But only a few days ago, I was stood at the grave of a 35-year-old lady Friend, we're not guaranteed tomorrow. We're not even guaranteed tonight. We don't know what will happen. But I tell you right now, the opportunity is there. Right now, you can be saved. And you can be saved forevermore. 1 Chronicles 28 and the verse 9 says, If thou seek him, he will be found of thee. That's the good news. If thou seek him, he will be found of thee, but... It goes on. But if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. Oh, friend, will you be saved today? You don't need me to speak to you. You don't need anyone else at all to speak to you. You can be saved in the very pew where you're sat. You can cry out, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And he'll take you. He'll save you. He'll do that for you. But friend, I plead. I plead best I can, come to the Savior. Don't forsake him. Seek Christ today. Maybe there's one here and you would like to speak with me. I'm more than happy to speak with you. Just indicate that and I'm more than happy to answer any questions you have. But come to Christ, friend. And then there will be a Savior for you. There will be heaven for you. And there will be a blessed reunion for you, even with Ellie Hamilton. You know, the Bible says when a soul gets saved that there is rejoicing in the whole of heaven when one sinner repenteth. You know this, if you were to get saved at this funeral service, Ellie Hamilton would know you got saved because your name will get shouted across the whole of heaven. She'll rejoice with all the angels and the saints. You got right with God. Oh, friend, will you not do that? Will you not do that and come to the Savior that Ellie loved and trusted. Are you ready for heaven? There is only one way. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. We're going to close by singing the last hymn in the order of service, please. If I could ask the congregation to please remain standing after the hymn for prayer, that would be appreciated. But Rock of Ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee, let the water and the blood from thy riven side which flowed be of sin the double cure, cleanse me from its guilt and power. Standing after the introduction, please.
Let's stand together. After the service this afternoon, the burial will be taking place at Ballaroni Presbyterian Church Burial Ground. The family will need to leave straight away, but you're very welcome to attend the committal. But if you're not going over to the cemetery, then you're very welcome to also go next door in the hall for tea. But if I could ask the congregation to please remain standing after the closing prayer, please. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do pray that thou would apply thy word to each and every heart. Save souls. And we pray that even this family and group of friends of Ellie Hamilton may trust her same Saviour and be ready for the great eternity. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with his people now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>